and thanks for joining us for this second virtual NAS expert lecture presented by Professor Michael Bruford. Professor Bruford is a professor of biodiversity in the School of Biosciences and Dean for Environmental Sustainability at Cardiff University in Wales, United Kingdom. Recently, Professor Bruford also joined the University of Pretoria as an extraordinary professor in the, in the Faculty of Natural and Agricultural Sciences, and he holds an A rating from the National Research Foundation in South Africa. Professor Bruford co-chairs the International Union for Conservation of Nature, that's the IUCN, Conservation Genetic Specialist Group, and is the academic lead for the Welsh Government's Biodiversity and Ecosystem Evidence Research Needs Program. He serves on the editorial boards of Conservation Genetics Resources, Frontiers and Genetics, Integrative Zoology, and Endangered Species Research. He was a founding editor for the journal Animal Conservation and served as editor-in-chief of Heredity between 2012 and 2016. His research concerns understanding genomic diversity and adaptation in threatened species and using the data to model and predict their future pathways in the face of climate change. He is a strong advocate of biodiversity biobanking and is director of the Frozen Ark, a globally endangered species biobank charity, and Cryo Arcs, the United Kingdom's zoological biobank. In 2020, Professor Bruford was elected a member of the Academia Europea, received the Marsh Award for Conservation Biology, and was awarded the Chimelong Medal of the China Zoological Society. The topic of the talk today is conserving genomic diversity for climate resilience in a changing world. Genomic diversity, and I'm going to refer to that as GD, is one of the three components of biological diversity that can be measured. And 30 years of population genetic and now genomic research has shown that GD estimators can provide sensitive indicators of change in demography, for example, in population size, connectivity, inbreeding, and hybridization, among others. Yet, despite its proven record, GD is rarely incorporated into conservation planning, and we have to ask the question why, and examine the prospects for its more meaningful inclusion in conservation policy and management in the future. Professor Bruford will examine the reasons for the limited traction that genetic science has gained in conservation. He will exemplify some case studies from his own work where genetic and genomic data can fundamentally change conservation management action, and he'll discuss prospects for how this situation may improve as we transition into a new decade of conservation planning. There's an opportunity for questions at the end of Professor Bru Bruford's um, lecture, so please engage in the chat line and type your questions in there, and afterwards we'll get round to them. For now, I'm introducing Mike, Professor Mike Bruford, over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Baron. It's a great pleasure to be here. And um, I'm very happy to, to, to talk to you this morning a little bit, of, oh, it's morning in the UK, sorry, um, to talk to you a little bit about genetic diversity and genomic diversity and how it can interface into conservation. Can, can I have, I the, have first the first slide, slide please? please? Okay. okay, so what I'm going to do today is break my presentation down into a few elements which um, reflect areas of my activity at the moment. Um, some of which are policy orientated and some of which are purely scientific. So I'm going to start off by giving us a little bit of background on where the development of policy is, or at least was, until the end of the last decade, until 2020, when the, the framework for global conservation policy um, was due to be reset. Then I'm going to um, talk about how genomic data has really informed the way we now think about how genetic diversity responds to anthropogenic change. Um, and I'm going to talk about one particular interesting element of that, which um, I think may become very important uh, as time goes on, and that is the emerging role of, of adaptive introgression. Um, and then I'm going to talk about how uh, introgression per se can really change the way we think about um, demographic history and population biology. And then finally, I'm going to bring us back to the current discussions that we've been having in and around the uh, 2030 framework for uh, biodiversity, the CBD post 2020 framework. And then we'll, we'll, we can have some questions after that. Next slide, please. <laughs> 
So yes. So if we talk a little bit then about how genetics has really um, uh, uh, developed over time, I would say that really genetic diversity has always been in the background of conservation thinking, came to the fore foreground probably in 1981 with the publication of Frankel and Soule's Conservation and Evolution. It was a very important book. And then really in the 1980s, it took off because of the um, transition from allozymes from protein markers to DNA based markers. That culminated in 1992 with um, the beginnings of the field of molecular ecology, which if you can def define that as a journal that is um, specifically oriented to that field, that's what it was. And that year 1992 is very important not only because molecular ecology started, but also because the Convention on Biological Diversity Rio Convention happened, the European Union's Habitats Directive also happened. And so at that point, uh, it became clear that genetics may have a role. Um, to the extent that by the year 2000, um, the journal Conservation Genetics had actually um, begun. Um, having said all of that, Lots and lots of papers were published, really interesting papers um, in and around the use of genetics uh, in conservation, but they were largely not being taken up when it came to management and policy. And in 2010, Linda Lycra and colleagues published a very important article which basically said that they weren't being taken up because there wasn't the policy driver to take them up. And the policy driver was, in fact, the Convention on Biological Diversity. Um, and so this paper neglect of genetic diversity um, in the implementation of the, the CPD was really very important in that context. And that really started a lot of discussions um, during the last decade, Le led to, in some extent, to the formation of the IUCN Conservation Genetics Specialist Group, but also through a lot of other activities as well. Next slide. And really, the main reason for that was that somewhat contrary to our expectations, the AE 2020 targets that came out of the CBD meeting in Japan in 2010 contained an explicit genetic target for the first time. And that basically stated that by 2020, the genetic diversity of cultivated plants, farmed and domesticated animals, their wild relatives, but, and here's quite an important but, including socioeconomically and culturally valuable species would be maintained and strategies developed and implemented for minimizing genetic erosion uh, and safeguarding genetic diversity. So that was a real surprise to see that, probably came as a result of Linda's paper in 2010. Next slide. The problem is that, as we know, um, and this has really been going on now for 30 years, these um, decadal targets that people um, have been uh, uh, setting haven't been met. The, we knew that um, it, in, in 2010, in Nagoya and in, in Aichi, that there wouldn't be very many targets met. And even a midterm assessment of the Aichi 2020 targets showed that they were failing largely. And that includes genetic diversity of, um, of, of, of uh, the world. And that was only being measured as the trend in the number of terrestrial livestock breeds, which, which you know, I think most of us would agree is a rather poor proxy for genetic diversity of all life on Earth. So not only did we have inadequate um, targets, we were even failing those. So we're really in a very, very um, difficult situation looking at that. And it's that sort of background, really, that has led us to redouble our efforts over the last few years to try and change it. Next slide, please. I'm going to come back at the end to how we have redoubled our efforts and where we are now, because I think it's generally good news. But what I'm going to do now is talk about the rate at which genomic diversity can change and how we can measure that change um, in using an example from two different falcon species that I've been working on with colleagues at the Chinese Academy of Sciences, 
and elsewhere to understand um, changes in, in genetic diversity as a result of anthropogenic and climate change, um, uh, land use and climate change in, in these species. Next slide. The first species I want to talk about is the peregrine falcon, and particularly this um, species, subspecies of that, Falco pelagrinus calidus, which breeds on the, the northern ocean of the Russian Arctic. These birds are incredible. They undergo some of the populations, undergo some of the long, longest migrations um, of non-oceanic birds, um, and they do so with real um, phylopatric accuracy. And what we've been doing is looking at these populations along the Arctic coast, some of which are really under threat because of climate change. Next slide, please. By, uh, by fitting satellite collars to these birds um, from, from the nest, we've been able to take genetic information. We've been able to follow their movements and ask what is their migratory pathway. One of the drivers for this is the CMS, the Convention Hello. Hello. 
I, I can't I can't see my slides or anything. I can only see um, bands of colour, I can't see the slides. Okay. Sorry about the technical problem. I was, um, I hope we can start again and it all works. I'm going to run the slides from this end. Um, so, as I was saying, we were been studying these Arctic breeding peregrines um, and they, they, we were able to study them at a number of sites along the northern Russian um, seaboard uh, and have been following their migratory pathway. Next slide, please. And in, in this slide, you should see, if you press the animation, you should see the, um, the, the, the birds virtually migrating over space. And this is just to give you an idea of how far these birds can actually migrate. It varies a lot, but some of them are actually able to migrate more than um, 8,000 or even 11,000 kilometers meaning that we have a huge amount of migratory heterogeneity in this single supposed 
single uh, population. In order to understand at very, very fine spatial scale the genetic difference between these migratory populations, the first thing we did was um, create the fourth and fifth, sorry, next slide, please, um, peregrine and Saker falcons genomes. So we, we were lucky in the sense that these falcons have relatively simple genomes in comparison to the um, to, to lots of different bird species. We were able to produce high, reasonably high quality reference genomes um, that we were able to use uh, for population genomic and transcriptomic studies. Next slide, please. And here you can see a picture of a couple of Saker falcon chicks. We've been studying these birds now um, uh, uh, for a, the same amount of time as we've been studying the peregrines. And here we were really interested as to how the, the Saker falcon spread across Eurasia, uh, where, it, where it lives in the very similar areas to the peregrine, although it doesn't hybridize with them. And um, we were particularly interested to look at its pan-Eurasian distribution. Next slide, please. And here you can see um, a map of Eurasia, and you can see in yellow areas where we were able to take samples from populations from the, the western edge of their distribution um, in Slovenia and Moldova through to the central part of their distribution in uh, Kazakhstan, um, further east um, to Mongolia, and then also further south east to their new population on the Qinghai Tibetan Plateau. And we found that the most genetically distinct and divergent um, population was the Qinghai Tibetan Plateau population. Um, and we looked at about 380,000 SNPs using the transcriptome, which covered about 67% of the total gene set of the annotated nuclear genome. Next slide, please. When we examined the, um, all of the SNPs that we were interested in that differentiated the population on the Qinghai Tibetan Plateau from the populations elsewhere, we found some really interesting results. The most important gene was the erythropoietin gene EPAS1, uh, where we found a non-synonymous substitution in the fourth exon of the EPAS1 gene. Um, and that um, gene EPAS1 is very, very important because it's been implicated in the hypoxia response in a large number of different um, vertebrate species that have been studied that are living on the Tibetan plateau. We also saw actually a very interesting pattern in the MH, MHC class 2b genes in three different non-synonymous substitutions, um, which indicated actually not directional selection, which we saw in EPAS1, which was basically um, fixation from a, um, a standing variation. But with the MHC uh, class 2 genes, we saw evidence of relaxed selection more diversity, more um, different amino acids in the population at those sites than you might expect by chance. Um, and that was very interesting. We also saw differential expression levels with lower um, MHC class 2b transcripts and higher EPAS1 transcripts um, in the Ch uh, Qinghai Tibetan Plateau population. And of course, as I said before, this is really interesting because what happens is EPAS1 um, is, uh, you know, it's an oxygen sensitive su subunit of uh, the hypoxia, hypoxia um, inducible response gene uh, HIF2. HIF2 regu regulates erythropoietin expression. It repre represses the hypoxia response, reduces red cell production. And so um, people who live on the uh, Tibetan plateau permanently don't have their blood becoming too full of red cells and um, are able to uh, have very, very highly efficient oxygen transport. And that's um, why they, they survive up there and can play football at 4,000 meters. Um, and the really interesting thing from the perspective of, of, of our work on the, um, the, the Saker falcon is that when we reconstructed the demographic history of that Saker population, it became clear that the Saker population 
on the Qinghai Tibetan Plateau has probably only invaded over the last 2000 years. So it's very recently responded to this massive um, uh, local, ad local adaptive selection pressure, just as it has done with the um, Tibetan pig, which has seems to have um, uh, got its EPAS-1 allele from the Tibetan wild boar, um, as the Tibetan dog has from the, the local gray wolf. And of course, in humans, you probably know that the um, most credible hypothesis is that the EPAS-1 gene in human populations in Tibetan people actually has its origin in the Denisovans. So here we see already this thing emerging, which is adaptive introgression, although that's not the case um, for the, the Seika uh, falcon, because in the case of the Seika, it seems to have got its, its, um, its gene from standing variation. If we then go back to the peregrines, we published a paper earlier this year where we were looking at the peregrine falcon, uh, next slide, sorry, we're looking at the peregrine falcons. Um, then we can see um, the, 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 um, the populations of peregrine, migratory populations of peregrine falcons are on the on 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 across Eurasia have very very different migratory pathways, and in fact fall into two major classes in terms of migration: short distance migration and long distance migration. And when we looked at those um, at, at those, it seemed that the longest migratory pathways were in the east of the distribution, and the shorter migratory pathways were in the the centre and the west in Kolb, Gweb, Kola and Popigai. Um, so we asked the question, is there any genetic differentiation between these migratory pathways and how different are they? Next slide, please. And we found indeed that the, um, there was substantial genetic differentiation between these different populations. On the, um, in the structure plot, you can see the intermediate population at K equals three, which is the population in Yamal, um, has a uh, is is somewhat mixed, but actually in general you can see an east and west split. And then when we look at the the time in which those splits happened, the major east west split occurred around twenty two thousand years ago. The next split within the the western edge, twelve thousand years ago, and sorry in the eastern edge, twelve thousand years ago, and in the western edge about ten thousand years ago. And when we look at the um, genetic differentiation between um, individuals as a result of uh, uh, correlated against migratory pathway length, we can see that there's a huge difference between the, um, genet the, the relationship between migratory pathway length and um, genetic difference if we just use neutral markers as opposed if we, to those that we see if we look at the 37 genes that have high selection signatures associated with them, where the R squared goes from 0 0.02 non-significant to 0 0.4 um, at a, a, a highly significant level. So it's clearly there are a subset of genes in the genomes of these birds which are enacting very strongly to differentiate migratory behavior. Next slide, please. And then when we look at that, we find a single gene that seems to explain a lot of that variation. And that gene is called the adenyl cyclase type 8 gene, otherwise, otherwise known as ADCY8. Um, and it is a gene that is very interesting because quite against our expectations, this gene isn't to do with um, behavior uh, in terms of migration. It's never been found to be linked, for example, to magnetic fields or any other migratory behavior, fueling strategies. Instead, this gene is actually linked in a number of studies to long-term memory. And this may be a special case because the, um, the birds that are migrating 10, 11,000 kilometers need to have long-term memory um, validation and very accurate long-term me memory to enable themselves to return to their natal sites to, to nest the following year. Um, and maybe long-term memory is really important to help that happen. Um, in fact, uh, the really interesting thing is that we see different expression levels 
of the um, the promote when we when we manipulate the promoters from the populations in the east and the populations in the west and do a functional test in developing chick hip hippocampus and we can see um, a, a big difference in expression levels between the um, the eastern and western um, uh, 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 haplotypes with the western haplotype being expressed significantly more strongly so clearly this particular allele of the um, uh, of ADCY8, um, the expression of which seems to be a, a limited by CPG methylation, um, has a, a big difference between the different regions, different geographic regions of peregrines. Next slide, please. Then when we start looking at the effective population size of these populations at the genomic level as a function uh, of time, um, what we did was it, we linked the genomic data that we had to the um, species distribution models that we were able to reconstruct using today's data for the last glacial maximum, the mid Holocene, and um, 50 years into the future in 2070, which is the um, what we would be predicting under a 1.5 degree climate change model um, from here on in. And what we can see is that over the last 25,000 years, the direction and magnitude of migratory pathways has changed, um, uh, really set itself, started to set itself during the mid -Hol Holocene. And what we have today um, is, a, is a largely um, east to west pathway um, of long and medium uh, length um, migratory distances, whereas in the, the, the glacial maximum, the migratory pathway was uh, west to east and shorter. By measuring the effective population size in the present day, linking it to the available breeding territory size, we could, we could um, simulate the effective population size of the populations in the past and look at how they may change in the future. And if you look at in the top um, right hand side of the slide, you can see the effective population sizes have undergone um, substantial decline um, in very re the very recent past. And in the bottom right, which is the predictions into the future, you can see the, some of these populations predicted to go extinct and all populations predicted to lose effective size. But it's not only the effective population size that will go. Actually, some of these breeding sites are predicted to appear, um, disappear just under standard climate models anyway. So for the, the population in Colgweb and Kola, they're predicted to change radically. Colgweb is predicted to disappear. Kola to, to, um, to move southwards and then actually to be a coalescence between the summer and wintering grounds for the peregrine falcon in the extreme west of its range, such that the migratory behavior it currently exhibits is likely to disappear. So you can see it's bad news overall for these populations. Next slide, um, and I'm back on the uh, introductory slide now, is about the emerging role of adaptive introgression as an accelerating influence in local adaptation. Next slide. And this study I'm going to illustrate with some work that we um, published last year on, on South American camelids. Um, and these are um, some of the most interesting domesticated animals, in my opinion. Um, this picture here, you can see two wild species and two domesticated species. The, um, the front uh, brown species is the vicuña that we originally thought would be the ancestor or some limited genetic data that we had indicated as the ancestor of the alpaca, which is behind it, the fleecy one with white ears. And then right at the back, you've got the wild guanaco, which is thought to be the, the, the wild ancestor of the domesticated yama, which is the large animal in the middle with the banana shaped ears. We wanted to use new genomic data to get a much better idea of what happened to these populations and how they became the way they are and whether or not there is, was introgression between them because our original genetic data indicated substantial introgression. So what we did, Next slide, please. 
was we sequenced a whole bunch of new genomes and created actually a lot of new reference genomes as well. So um, what we did is we, um, so I'm just going to click that, was we um, created a new phylogeny for this group of species using 6 million SNPs, um, one SNP per 250 base pair window, and did a simple phylogenetic tree on um, fourfold degenerate sites. Um, and we looked at the, the, the relationship between the wild and domesticated forms. And in the um, lower part of the phylogeny um, that you can see here, you've got two groups of yellow um, organisms um, blocked off. And these are the two wild subspecies of, um, of the Guanaco. Um, at, and they group where we would have expected them to. Um, the, and, then, and then there is a, a southern subspecies of Guanaco, which is um, in, uh, in, in purple, um, which, is, which was never domesticated. And then in, in, in uh, red, you can see all of the llamas, um, which were domesticated from Llama Guanaco caxalensis. And these, these patterns make sense some geographic uncertainty about the range of Caxalensis, but they make sense. Um, but what doesn't make sense is the upper half of the phylogeny, where the basal um, taxa are in fact the, um, the, uh, the alpaca, um, two different groups of alpaca, um, and then the two wild um, uh, populations of Vicunia, 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 Vicunia in blue, and Vicunia, Vicunia mensalis, which is the supposed um, origin uh, of domestication in, in uh, mustard colour, were are grouping together, the alpaca were not. And that really pu puzzled us because we would have expected them to in-group within the mensalis group. But when we did admixture analysis, so if you come now across to the left-hand side of the, of the uh, slide, when we did admixture analysis, it, it became immediately apparent why. And you can see here at k equals two and k equals three, the alpaca is almost, well, in fact, it's about 40% yama. You can see in both k2 and k3, the large purple elements in the genome of the alpacas um, shows huge levels of admixture um, coming through from yama. And that pattern persists until you get up to k equals five. So that's really interesting. Um, it shows us that we had a huge problem when we actually uh, wanted to do the analysis of the demographic history of these animals because we had to disentangle this problem. Uh, what we did was um, a whole variety of different kinds of admixture testing using ABBA -BABA, um, phylogenetic um, analysis, using local ancestry inference with uh, involving both the Bactrian camel with and without the Bactrian camel, and trying to infer the number of admixture events and the genes which had been admixed. Um, for, but although you can't see, um, if we go to the next slide, although you can't see that these two patterns are different, the, the two histograms for admixture in blue and in red, one is for llama in blue, one is red um, for alpaca, or the, the, the admixture of proportions in the Yama is about 4% of the genome and in the alpaca about 40% of the genome. Many more genes admixed into the alpaca than in the Yama. There are still quite a few genes in the Yama which have been admixed in um, and, and some really um, standout ones in terms of their, in terms of their um, uh, level of selection as well. Next slide, please. Now I'm showing a slide of an example of how this has happened. So we were curious to know uh, what genes were involved in some of the phenotypes of these alpacas and yamas. Here is a very well-known phenotype, white fleece, blue eyes, and actually also hereditary deafness as well. And what we wanted to do was to find the gene that was responsible for that, which we were able to do, which is endothelin um, three. E EDN3, we looked at its gene sequences in Guanaco and in Vicuña, and then in Yama and Alpaca. Uh, 
And what we found was, in fact, that the the sequences that we find in Yama and Alpaca only come from the Vicuña and not from the Wanaco. So the the what that tells us is that this is a phenotype that was recovered from the uh, the genome, the variation in the genome of the Vicuña in the alpaca when it was domesticated, and then admit uh, deliberate introgression um, and deliberate hybridization um, has port ported across this phenotype into the genome of the Yama as well. So this phenotype has its origin in the, the Cunha, or at least in the alpaca, um, uh, and its original genomic architecture in the genome of the Vicuña. In contrast, next slide, we have a really interesting region called the ANTRX2 um, region, which is um, comprises a large number of genes involving all sorts of, it, of different interesting pheno phenotypes like anthrax susceptibility, fleece length, but most important, perhaps, high altitude blood pressure. And we find that um, a gene has its original origin actually in the um, in the guanaco, not in the vicuña. So this is a, a, a whole haplotype that seems to be imported across during domestication from the guanaco into the yama and then adaptively introgressed from the yama into the, um, into the uh, alpaca, allowing the alpaca to persist at high altitudes. So if we did this kind of analysis for a whole bunch of different genes. Next slide. This table, which is, shows you what has been introgressed, shows a whole bunch of different phenotypes um, have seem to be have been selected. And these included um, those to do with fiber color, fiber quality, um, some of which look as though they are probably more likely to be naturally selected. So in both directions to do with um, olfaction and dietary choice, but also, um, as I say, fleece length, um, ability to survive at high altitude, hypoxia regulation, and um, fleece colour as well. So a lot of very interesting phenotypes that appear to have been partly brought across from uh, because of adaptive introgression and partly brought across because of deliberate breeding by the, um, the South American um, campesinos in, 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 uh, in, in, in the Andes. Okay, why is that important? Why is that interesting? Next slide. The question is now then, why is that important in terms of what we can infer? Um, our next slide. I showed you this or a version of this tree previously. What I didn't show you is what happens when you remove all the intragress segments. And that's what we did. It was a bioinformatics nightmare. So we cleaned the genomes of both the most likely um, high Bacunia ancestry um, in uh, sequences, so only um, high, very high, 43% of high Bacunia ancestry ge um, genome remained. Um, and what the other part was the, the other approach was to take only the very highest assigned Winarco um, genome out. And so you have this gray area between 43 and 64. So these are the were the two most extreme. But if you look at this kind of analysis, this is actually um, the the high Guanaco ancestry only removed. So this is the least conservative analysis. The tree goes back into place. And in fact, you see that the alpacas all then group with Vicuña, Vicuña mensalis. So the tree goes back into shape. Now we can start inferring something about the demographic history. Next slide, please. And this is uh, one very good example. This is about long-term changes in effective population size, calculated using a single reference genome, using a method called PSMC, a pairwise sequential Markovian coalescent. And the first uh, in the bottom right is a PSMC, oops, sorry, is a PSMC plot that was produced in a paper that was published in 2014. And the PSMC plot for the alpaca is in that um, in, in that paper in green. You can see the, the pattern is really quite different and nowhere near as different um, as it is in that plot. There is still 
a population effective population size uh, um, peak somewhere in the region of 50,000 years ago. So that the, the timing is the same, but the magnitude is completely different. It's nowhere near as high. So if you have um, admixed components in the genome, you have to be very careful to filter them out when you do PSMC and similar kinds of analysis. Next slide, please. When we used um, SNP, linkage disequilibrium based effective population size analysis for very recent um, changes in effective size, what we find is the, the population of, of um, South American camelids over the last 200 generations has undergone a pretty um, substantial decline, um, really up until mo the, pretty much the present day, from um, an effective size of four to 5,000, um, 200 generations ago, all the way down to um, an effective population size of somewhere in the region of two to 300 in the present day. When you look at the, the change in the, the, um, the steepness of that curve, which is not obvious in the original plot, but you plot the ch changes, the delta in steepness, we see a, 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 an interesting um, standout event about 110 years ago, 110 generations ago, sorry. And that 110 generations ago is meaningful. If you remember, um, when I showed you the local ancestry influence plot, the, the time of which the, the um, admixture happened, we estimated both at 110 and 120 generations ago for both Yama and Alpaca, despite the fact that the proportion of admixture was really different. And what that meant was that um, something happened that both increased admixture and precipitated a decline in population size, but at the same time, 110 generations ago. So what could that actually be? Next slide. Well, it turns out that the generation time, the average generation time for South American camelids is about five years. And if you um, do the maths, then the best fitting event that, that actually um, may explain what's happened here is actually the arrival of the Spanish, the Spanish conquest in 1530. And this is partly because um, there was a, essentially a genocide, either because of the war or because of disease. And most of the herders from the Inca empire and the other empires were lost. But also because the Spanish, when you read their records, did not rec recognize the existence of two different domesticated forms of South American camelid. They called them both sheep. Um, and there's no written records kept by the South American um, lo local population as to how that they, they carried out the, the breeding. And so with the large scale deaths that happened in the rural communities, after in the hundred years after the Spanish conquest, probably all of the original breeding practices broke down. So these events that I'm describing here in terms of using genomics, we can really get up to very recent times indeed. And with SNP, we can get it in, within a few hundred years. So that means that we have a lot of um, uh, ability now to start examining changes in effective population size in very recent time. So finally, I'm going to return, next slide, to the current policy situation and prospects for the future. Well, in the last um, three or four years, we have really upped our game globally in terms of how we've been trying to put pressure on the, um, the, the policy arena to take genetic diversity seriously, not only for domesticated species, but for wild species as well, um, in the Convention on Biological Diversity discussions and pursuance of the new framework. And we published a, a bunch of papers um, that, have, that have looked at this um, and really got a global consensus um, through working together. And these papers seem to have been, um, been re read by the policymakers. And indeed, there seems to be some traction now within the CBD. But it's only by working together that we've been able to do this. Next slide. 
And this is really a schematic of the different groups that have been working together to get this off the ground. So the conservation genetic specialist group of the IUCN in the bottom um, in the bottom left, that's been work that we've been doing, really trying to um, get the policy documents together um, and inform governments. We've also been working with the group on Earth observations, GeoBon, to try and operationalize genetic data in a global Earth ob observation context. But we've also been working with groups such as the Society for Conservation Biology, Conservation Genetics Working Group, and um, a pro ongoing project projects like the European Cost Action G Bike. So we've been working, it seems like David and Goliath sometimes, but we've been working together producing these publications now and really trying to get traction at the CBD level. And we've come up, we, we realized that we needed to, next slide, please, needed to come up with indicators. So we've come up with three indicators. The first one for, for a particular species is the number of populations within species with an effective population size above 500, which is usually um, viable compared to the number below 500. That's the first indicator that you could use at a national or at a species or a regional level. The second indicator is the proportion of populations that are actively being maintained within species. And that's a proxy essentially for local adaptation. The more populations being maintained, the more of the total species armory of genetic diversity that's being maintained. So because even if the population is small, it may still be unique. So the effective population size only gives you part of the story. And then finally, at a national level, the number of species and populations in which genetic diversity is being monitored using DNA based methods. In other words, does your country have a national genetic monitoring program and how well is it operating? So these are the indicators that we proposed um, and they've been, well, generally speaking, well received. Um, and now, as you probably know, there's a lot of discussion going on. Um, we're getting towards the end game for the framework. Um, and we see now a number of indicators of traction. The first thing is the inclusion of wild species. Next slide, sorry, at the CBD level. The indicator of wild species uh, is also included in the CBD documentation. And then at least 90% of genetic diversity, and here we mean effective size, is maintained within all species. So um, we, we have to wait and see how that may change or whether it survives going into the final draft. But at the moment, at least, we have both targets and milestones that make some sense within the context of what we've been trying to develop. Um, OK, I'm sorry for all of the technical problems. A lot of the work that I've described to you today on the peregrine and Saker falcons, but it, um, especially also on the, the um, South American camelids, was carried out during a, um, a sabbatical that I had at the Chinese Academy of Sciences in Beijing. But also I must acknowledge my colleagues, Nick Fox and Andrew Dixon on the falcon side. Many people have worked with us at the global policy level, um, including a, a really active group in South Africa um, and, uh, you know, a, a really very impressive group of people working on that uh, in general. So I think it all only uh, remains for me to thank everybody for listening, for apologising for the problems, and I'm very happy to take any questions. Th thank you very much, uh, uh, Mike really insightful and it's it's always nice to see someone looking back over a large body of work and really unpacking the the details and the lessons learned from there i think we've got time for two quick questions well one is a little bit longer but but my, my first question is <coughs> sometimes conservation hello. hello is my go so, so sometimes conservation science involves um, elements of a crisis discipline, especially when you've got really dwindling populations. And then there's a school of thought that says, let's just get these animals into a zoo or let's, let's just get a fence around them, sort of a triage effort. How would you see that type of conservation science interface 
with the sort of tools and monitoring that you've just mentioned? Mike, can you hear us? Oh, I, think, I think we've lost Mike. And another technical glitch, a slightly more fatal one this time. And I think we will uh, we'll definitely take the, that, my last question, and the question that, that I've just had on the, on the chat line, uh, we'll definitely get them to uh, Professor Bruford and then with some feedback on a different platform, perhaps at our next event. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, I'm really interested, and I'm really, um, I'll put it this way, my interest has peaked about the potential for genomic diversity to inform some practical hands-on conservation um, especially looking at some of the recent changes, um, hundreds of years for, for um, in the chameleons in South America and also 2,000-year uh, changes in the Saco falcons. Just amazed at the rate of adaptation that can happen. And uh, what we'd like to ask Professor Bruford in a different, different opportunity is just, just what opportunities does that um, provide us or what wriggling room does that provide us provide for us? dealing with uh, climate change um, oh, adaptation? I can hear, I can hear. So, uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate you joining us. Apologies for the technical glitches, but I still hope that uh, you, you got out of this uh, presentation something worthwhile and there's certainly a few references that you can go and follow up on and see what else Professor Bruford's been up to. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful afternoon and remember, vaccinate. <laughs>